Good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Shenning, and welcome to chapel. Um, so we're going to start off with a song called Honey in the Rock, and probably most of you guys have heard it, um, but it takes, it takes its, um, the theme of the song from Psalm 81, verse 16. But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. And this song is really about the Lord's provisions in the toughest of times and the trials and tribulations, because this is King David writing this psalm. And it's really just a, a whole, you know, I'm just crying out like the nation of Israel does not respect you, Lord. The nation of Israel does not follow you, Lord. We are struggling, but you are still good. You are still our God. And that's what this is about. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone. Man on the ground, no matter where I go, I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got. There's honey in the rock. Please stand as we worship. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for a living well, only you can satisfy. Now I've tasted, it's not hard to see that only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. Freedom, where the 
pay the price for all my guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh. he makes a way satisfy all of our desires and you provide for all of our needs there there is sweetness in you lord there is uh, water and provision you give us so many things that we need but above all lord you give us yourself you give us fellowship with you relationship with you you have gone to the cross to provide for our sins you have risen from the dead to give us new life and lord you will give us a life with you here and a life in eternity. So we thank you for that. And every time we meet, Lord, we remember what you have done for us and what you continue to do as you intercede for us even now before the Father. So, Lord, as your servant comes to preach the word this morning, may you anoint his mouth and may you anoint our ears. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. joy to be here, and uh, I'm always humbled by the opportunity. Thank you, Jazz Band and others. If uh, you've come this morning, uh, the pressure is now off me because we've already worshipped. So that, uh, that makes it easier on me. Find in your Bible, if you would, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, and uh, we're going to talk about, yesterday we talked about time. Today I'm going to talk about the theme of history. The two things are only slightly related in this case. Genesis chapter 4, but before we do that, we need to set the stage just a little bit because a whole lot happens between Genesis 1 and Genesis 4. As you know, Genesis is the book of beginnings. It tells us the origin of everything. And the first three chapters of Genesis are filled with these turning points in history. Genesis 1 tells us about the creation of the universe. Genesis chapter 2 tells us, uh, it fills in all the details about the creation of mankind, about Adam and Eve, and proves that indeed everything that God created was good. And then we hit Genesis 3. Talk about turning points. There are a dozen firsts in Genesis 3 that have, through the ages, impacted every human being who ever drew a breath. In Genesis 3, we see Earth's first lie. Surely, you will not die. And it spirals down from there. We have, man's, we have Earth's first lie, followed by man's first temptation. A woman saw the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. We see man's first sin. She took of its fruit and ate in her husband with her. Man's first shame. The eyes of both of them were opened and that they, they knew then that they were naked. Man's first feeble attempt at a works-based salvation. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Notice the words, they sewed fig leaves together, made for themselves Coverings. They're trying already to, by the work of their hands, restore themselves. We see man's first attempt at hiding from God. 
The Bible says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden and they hid themselves in the trees of the garden. We see man's first fear. The Lord called after them, where are you? And Adam answered, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. We see man's first excuse. It's kind of ironic. The man points at the woman and says, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Excuses. We see man's first confession. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? In verse 13, the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Man's first exposure to God's judgment. So the Lord God said to the serpent, and he said to the man, and he said to the woman... In verse 15, God's first proclamation of the gospel. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God's first symbol of atonement. In verse 21, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made coverings of skin and clothed them. It is a sacrifice. The first life taken is the life of an animal that is killed by the one who created it, a substitution to cover them. Verse 23, God's first act of spiritual separation. The Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Verse 24 says, He drove the man out and placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way. Previously, God had separated light from darkness. He separated earth from the sea. He separated the serpent from the rest of the animals. He separated good from evil. He separated mortal from the immortal. Now he separated man from God. Turning points. And that sets the stage for Genesis chapter 4. We see these first verses together. We'll read them in a moment. But everything's changed. Now that sin has entered into the world, the story of God's creation, uh, again, we have a turning point. Moves to the story instead of God's redemption. The history of the universe now focuses through the remainder of the Bible on the history of mankind. With all the first we've seen, now we see the creation of the first false worship. It's the worship of one's self. It is built on the sin of pride. Actually, there is only one sin, and it's pride. You got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. You got Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden. It's the same sin that you and I, if we're honest, wrestle with every single day. Deep down, I want to be God, and so do you. It's the origin. Let's look first at the origin of false religion. In chapter 4, I'm reading, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. You know the story. We see, first of all, their birth, the multiplied pain in childbearing from the previous chapter is quickly experienced. The use of the word and in these verses moves the narrative along. I think we can assume that Eve was probably pleased with the birth of her son. The name Cain is really impossible to trace. I believe Dr. Newell, there's really difficult to understand it. Uh, Notice what she said. I have acquired a man from the Lord. That in and of itself is difficult in the Hebrew. It's awkward. It can be translated, I have acquired a man with the help of the Lord. But I think more literally, I have acquired a man, even the Lord. If that's the case, maybe, just maybe, we don't know, but maybe Eve believed her son Cain to be the coming Messiah who would crush the head of the serpent. Remember, all of this... In the narrative, all of this seems to happen very, very quickly and sequentially. They were created, they sinned, they were cursed, they were expelled, and they're giving birth. And it appears to be in a pretty short amount of time. 
And I think about, I try and think about what it must have been like to be outside the garden. They no doubt remained close to the gate of the garden, I believe. It was protected by the cherubim. They saw the flaming sword that would keep them from entering back in, but they probably had not strayed far by the end of chapter 3. They likely longed for the paradise already that they had lost. Life was now much more difficult than it was. I think they were eager to see their relationship with God fully restored. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, the Bible says that God drove them out. I don't think they wanted to leave. I mean, why would they? So within a relatively short period of time, a second son was born. This is Abel, Cain's brother. The name Abel means vapor or breath. It's a bit of an ironic prophecy to the short life that her second born would live. That's their birth. Now let's look at their vocations. In verse 2, the Bible says Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground. Both are rather noble professions. They're both very useful. Both make use of the earth that God had provided. Both uh, vocations were certainly of value. Cain kept the family in food. Abel, no doubt, made good use of the wool. Lamb chops, I think, were not invented yet. We don't see mankind eating meat until Genesis 9. That would come. It's interesting. Cain was not the first farmer. Adam was. But Abel was likely the first shepherd. Both are noble professions. Both are distinct professions. That little conjunction, but, indicates that there is a distinction between their vocation. One tends to the living, the other the non-living. I wonder, too, if there was not a distinction in the workload. I could be wrong, but I tend to see Cain toiling in the soil in the hot sun over the thorns and weeds, while Abel is in the shade of a tree up on the hillside, watching over his timid little sheep. When I think of that, I can't help but think of the prominence of the idea of a shepherd in the Scripture. How can you not think of David, the shepherd who would become a king? And throughout the Bible, shepherding is a picture of God's care of pastoral care of Christ's church. So we see their birth and we see their vocations. Now look at their instruction. Verse 3 says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. In the process of time really means after a period of time. We don't know how long, but the assumption is it seems to be that the boys are much older now, uh, perhaps even young adults. So why did they see the need to bring an offering to God? Were they automatically instilled with some desire to worship? Did they have the same experience as their parents walking in the, uh, in the coolness of the day with the Lord Himself? No. You see, things are different now. Remember, there was a turning point. So Cain and Abel are born with a sin nature. They are born outside the paradise of the garden. So how do they know to bring an offering to the Lord? I think they were taught by their parents. Now think about this for a few moments. They had grown up, no doubt, looking at that garden gate, which was now guarded, they had likely seen that flaming sword afar off and been told by their parents, you may not enter. They'd grown up hearing about that dreadful day when paradise was lost. It's not like Adam and Eve just simply forgot about it. One commentator said they had grown up looking perhaps at the tattered clothing of animal skins fashioned by a holy God to cover their sinful guilt and shame. You can kind of imagine Adam and Eve hanging on to those garments because of what they represented. They'd been taught by their parents that they had sinned, and the soul that sinneth, it shall die. They'd been taught by their parents that they were born in sin, with a nature set 
in antagonism toward the very God who created them. Things are different now. They have been taught that as sinners, they must not, cannot enter into God's presence without bringing an appropriate offering. They have been properly taught. It was made clear even by God himself who confronted Cain with the awful truth in verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. The clear insinuation is that both Cain and Abel knew what was acceptable and knew what was not. So this is the first family. We see their birth, we see their vocations, we see their instructions. Now let's look at their offerings. Again, verse 3 says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, I'm assuming that this comes as somewhat as a, of, a, of a surprise to Cain. I mean, he's sitting there looking at his brothers, looking at his, and he's saying, well, why is mine not acceptable? Why was Abel's offering accepted by God? Why, why was Cain's rejected? And again, there are several possibilities. I, there are three real possibilities that I came up with. Uh, as I studied through this. The first is that Cain's offering was not of sufficient quality. Perhaps he had brought fruit of the ground that was only mediocre. And we talked about yesterday, we mentioned the difficulties when you have mediocrity creeping in as your standard. Maybe it wasn't his very best, and we know that God deserves the very best. But I don't really think that's why his offering was unacceptable. The second possibility is that Cain's offering was made with impure motives and a bad attitude. This is probably one of the most popular views of this. Some point to verse 5 where Cain is angry and upset, and they say, see, his heart wasn't in it. But I don't think that's the correct reason either. If you read carefully, you see that Cain was angry and upset only after God rejected his offering. It was the rejection itself that made him mad. The third possibility, and this is the one I hold to, is not due to Cain's poor quality or his poor attitude. The reason that God accepted Abel's offering and would not, could not accept Cain's offering was because Abel's offering was a blood sacrifice. And Cain's offering of fruit and vegetables was not. Now the commentator in Hebrews chapter 11 says this, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. Again, these are some interesting verses. More excellent means of more value, better worth. After all, it cost the life of his lambs. Cain's offering acknowledged God as creator. Abel's offering acknowledged God as redeemer. The Bible says in Hebrews there was a witness that he was declared righteous. God himself stated that Abel's offering was acceptable, that he had done well, and Cain had not. And then it mentions this, though he is dead, he still speaks. Well, I think two things jump out at me there. First of all, though he is dead, the significance of his sacrifice still instructs us today. Nothing's changed. God is dogmatic. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But secondly, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10 suggests that Abel's innocent blood called out for justice. The Lord said, The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And I think that's significant as well. Nothing has changed. Sin requires judgment. The wages of sin is still death. That penalty for sin must be paid with blood. Your blood or a substitute. Because just as Abel's sacrifice demonstrated, the innocent may die on behalf of the guilty. So we see the first family, the origin of the first false religion. It is a bloodless religion of human works rather than one born of faith in God's substitutionary plan. It is a religion of personal pride. 
And might I say that every one of the world's religions, apart from Christianity, follows this mold. So we see the origin of the first false religion. Now let's look at the results of this first false religion of personal pride. First of all, verse 5 tells us there is open confrontation with God, and it is manifest, demonstrated in anger. The Bible says, And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. This is not the fallen countenance of being sad and sorrowful. This is the setting of the face in defiance. There's a confrontation with God. Then there's an open invitation by our Lord to come to salvation. Look, he offers a way back. In verse 6, the Lord says to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? He didn't say you would have been accepted. He said, will you not? I believe that God is giving this, this faulty religion an opportunity to be restored. There's a warning given next. And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Lies at the door. Sin lies at the door. It's the same phrase as a crouching like an animal. Where have we heard that before? 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yet God's word says, but you should rule over it. I think that's the plea to exercise dominion over sin as though it were an animal that the first family did indeed rule over at one point in the garden. So after the warning is given, look what happens in verse 8. A murder is committed. The Bible says that Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. I mean, think about what's happening here. The very first family is guilty of the very first murder. All a result of the fallenness of man. It's like the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So does sin. Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say, sin takes you where you don't want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you more than you want to pay. Well, guess what happens next? After the first murder is committed, there's a cover-up. Verse 9, the Lord says to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? How often have we quoted that? Verse 10, we see judgment. The Lord says, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. Next, there's fear. Another result. Notice it's not a plea for forgiveness. Cain is not asking for forgiveness. He's asking for protection. He said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Instead of saying, Take it away, he said, Protect me. Surely you have driven me out at this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. He's not begging for forgiveness. He's looking for a place to hide. And in verse 15, there's a promise. The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone... Finding him should kill him. It's amazing. Even though there is no indication whatsoever of sorrow, much less repentance, God's mercy reaches beyond the ignorant pride of Cain and offers him protection, even for the guilty. Well, since this is a, really a Bible lesson instead of a sermon... Let me give you five quick lessons 
to wrap things up today. Number one, sin no longer requires the devil's deception. There's no mention of the serpent, no mention of the devil. Where did Cain's sin come from? He was born in sin. There are even Baptists today who say, no, just like the Muslims, no, man is born perfectly innocent. The Apostle Paul reminds the church at Ephesus that we are sinners by nature, children of wrath. So sin no longer requires the devil's deception. You have enough temptation and enough evil in you, just as I do. Lesson number two. The original communion with God has been broken. We're not walking in the, in the sweet garden anymore. Spiritual truths must now be taught. Seems like everywhere I go and I talk to, and I've had a conversation with some missionaries just the other day, they said our biggest weakness overseas is discipleship. And I thought, overseas? I think our biggest weakness in today's church is discipleship. Spiritual truth is not natural to us. It must be taught. Lesson number three. From our lesson, sinful mankind may not approach a holy God without an appropriate sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Number four. The wages of our own sin is death. We are each held accountable. However, in God's redemptive economy, there may be a substitute. The innocent may indeed die on behalf of the guilty. For 1,500 years, the Jews learned that they would offer those sacrifices. The Bible tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It was a great big 1,000-year, 1,500-year object lesson that the substitute had to be perfect. And he came, and his name is Jesus. Number five, God's mercy outweighs man's pride. Even in abject rebellion against him, God in his compassion leaves the door open for repentance. What a glorious God we serve. Heavenly Father, thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you that even though we are by nature children of wrath, you have provided a, a new nature, a new heart in Christ Jesus. Father, help us to learn the lessons of the Old Testament, as the Apostle Paul said, so we don't have to repeat them today. Let our minds and our hearts and our lives be free of pride, full of humility, quick to repent. Thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray.